Welcome to our presentation on post-stroke complications, bladder and bowel care. My name is Jeffrey. My name is Grace. The objectives of this presentation are to understand the frequency and implication of bladder and bowel complications post-stroke and to learn some simple treatments to prevent or address them. We will start off by talking about the urinary complications first and finish up with the fecal complications at the end. To start things off, we just like to highlight that medical complications are common post-stroke and have been said to occur in up to 96% of patients after a stroke, and they tend to occur in the older patients or patients with more severe strokes. We will highlight three main urinary complications, urinary tract infection, incontinence and retention, of which UTI is the single most common medical complication that occurs during stroke rehabilitation. To put things in context, based on this large study done by Roth and All in 2001, up to 30% of patients had a urinary tract infection during their stroke recovery phase, as compared to other common conditions such as pneumonia, DVT, PE or peptic ulcer disease. Risk factors for UTI include having an IDC, being more than 65 years old, being female, having pre-morbid urinary incontinence of any type, anterior circulation strokes or previous strokes, use of antidepressants or anticholinergics or things that will cause retention of urine, and having a post-void residual urine of more than 100 ml. Patients with UTI were 57% less likely to be discharged to their own homes as compared to people without. So avoiding unnecessary catheterization is likely the single most effective strategy to prevent UTI. Consider potting patients 4 hourly while they are awake if their post-white residual urine is between 100 to 200 ml. Ensure that patients get adequate fluid and move their bowels daily. Sit patients out of bed as soon as they are stable and encourage them to wipe in the commode or toilet. Despite your best care, should your patient get a urinary tract infection, please treat them following standard hospital guidelines. We will now move on and talk about urinary incontinence. UI is another common problem post-stroke. Most of it usually resolves spontaneously within 8 weeks of the stroke onset. But for 14 to 90% of patients, they may develop UI symptoms that persist at 6 months after a stroke. For these patients, their social function could be significantly affected as they may choose to not leave house for fear of wetting themselves. They also experience significantly increased costs in terms of having to buy diapers, or they may very well choose to be catheterized. There are three main mechanisms of urinary incontinence. Firstly, there's urge incontinence and bladder hyperreflexia due to disruption of the neuromicturation pathways. Secondly, incontinence can result from stroke-related motor, cognitive or language deficits despite normal bladder function. Thirdly, overflow incontinence and bladder hyporeflexia can be due to concurrent neuropathies or medications that are unrelated to the acute stroke. Let's move on and talk about the management of urinary incontinence. So how can we manage UI? Firstly, take a proper history to distinguish between the three mechanisms as mentioned above. Ruling out UTI as a cause of the UI symptoms is also important. Secondly, we can attempt behavioral or non-pharmacological treatment to control the UI symptoms. This will be covered by GRACE in subsequent slides. And thirdly, consider a referral to urology if further workups such as urodynamic studies are needed. Urology can also discuss the benefits of anticholinergics to control their symptoms. Moving on to the nursing management for urinary incontinence. First, physical exercise. Kegel exercise, or also known as pelvic floor exercise. This exercise helps to strengthen the pelvic floor muscles, helps to hold the uterus, bladder, and bowel in place. These muscles also act like control valves around the uterus, tightening when you increase your intra-abdominal pressure, for example coughing, to prevent any urine from leaking and relaxing when you pass urine. How to do Kegel exercise? 
First, we need to educate on locating the right muscles. We can ask the patient to stop urination in midstream or tighten and contract your anus, uterus inside the body or imagine having a strong urge to urinate but have to stop oneself from doing so. After getting the right muscles, we can start the exercise by asking the patient to tighten its pelvic floor muscles and hold for 5 seconds and then relax for 5 seconds. Repeat 5 times, gradually increase these slow contractions to 10 times. Repeat the contractions and relaxations of the pelvic floor muscles a few times until they are aware of the sensation. While doing the exercise, avoid holding their breath, breathe freely during exercise throughout. Aim for at least 3 sets of 10 repetitions a day. This exercise can be done either by lying down, sitting or standing. Second, bladder training or bladder re-education is strongly recommended for management of stress and urge urinary incontinence. This is an example of how a bladder diary looks like. Nursing interventions include time scheduled voiding, double voiding, enhanced toileting accessibility, providing ambulation device if necessary, preventive measures including incontinence sheets, pad, diapers, and street intake and output chart to record the frequency, timing, amount of fluid intake output, and to observe the number of bladder accidents per day. This provide baseline information for patients who with enhanced self-awareness of his or her fluid intake and elimination situation. Third, dietary and fluid modification. Ensure patients receive adequate fluid intake of 2 liters per day, adequate on avoiding alcohol, caffeine, citric fruits, and spicy food. Now, let's move on to the management of urinary retention. For urinary retention, two mechanisms tend to predominate. In acute retention, this is due to inactivity or hyporeflexia of the detrusor muscle commonly within the first 72 hours post-stroke. After the first 72 hours, other mechanisms tend to predominate, such as detrusor sphincter dyssynergia or incomplete bladder emptying. How to manage urinary retention? Firstly, remove medications that may worsen this, such as anticholinergics or antismasmodics. Rule out urinary tract infection. Mobilize patients as soon as they can and encourage voiding trials. Moving on to nursing management for urinary retention. First, voiding trial. Encourage to void at a regular scheduled time, usually 2-3 to three hourly interval is recommended. Prom voiding can improve dryness in patients with mild to moderate urinary retention. Encourage double voiding. Bladder ultrasound can be done by a trained nurse to assess post-void residual urine after every void to assess bladder volume. Second, prom voiding toilet program. Regular monitoring of patient's voiding and prompting the patient to avoid. Provide privacy during voiding and be allowed to sit on the toilet or toilet substitute, for example, commode, for at least 15 minutes. This is a nurse-led urinary screening flowchart for post-stroke patients in rehab unit. On the day of admission to rehab ward, patients are tasked to inform nurses once he or she has void. Bladder ultrasound will be used to assess post-void residual urine, which is also known as PVIU, within 30 minutes after he or she has void. If the volume is more than 150 ml, we will encourage patients to use commode chair, urinal in standing position, or assist patient to toilet. We encourage patients to double void to fully empty his or her bladder. If bowel is not open for more than two days, we will notify doctors accordingly and assist patient to clear his or her bowel and re-attempt to assess his or her PVIU again after the next void. If the next void PVIU is still more than 150 ml, we will document accordingly and notify physicians or the rehab specialty nurse for further management. After admission to the rehab ward, if patient does not void more than 4 hours, Nurses will do a physical examination to assess for lower abdominal distension, 
suprapubic tenderness or pain. If symptoms persist or present, we will inform the physician accordingly. Other measures and supportive cares also include intermittent catheterization, which is also known as INC. It's recommended as a supportive measure for patients. INC prevents the bladder from becoming overly distended. Overly distended bladder may have high intravesical pressure, which can cause damage to the upper urinary tract as a result of reflux to the kidney. It is usually performed by nurses or caregivers every 3 to 6 hourly, depending on individual retention volume. Indwelling urinary catheterization, which is also known as IDC, is recommended for patients with an obstructive cause where other interventions are not feasible. Next, we will move on to constipation and fecal incontinence management. Constipation and fecal incontinence There is variable data as to the frequency of constipation post-stroke due to the high variability in diagnostic criteria, but estimates put it as up to 66% of patients post-stroke. For fecal incontinence, the reported range is 7-56%, to but most of it resolves in less than two weeks. There are a variety of risk factors for fecal incontinence, and these include the stroke territory, the mobility and functional limitations of patients, and the severity of stroke. Total anterior infarction is an independent predictor of the presence of fecal incontinence. Problems with toilet access and constipating drugs are modifiable risk factors post-stroke. For the medical management of fecal incontinence, do a per rectal examination. This is to rule out fecal impaction, concurrent spinal cord injury, or rectal tumor as a cause of the fecal incontinence. There is limited literature regarding the management of fecal incontinence, but deal with causes such as lack of mobility or toilet access, and medications that may worsen the condition. And adopt the watch and wait approach, as most of which will resolve in 6 months from the stroke. Let's move on and talk about the nursing management of fecal incontinence and constipation. Nursing management for fecal incontinence includes environmental and lifestyle modification, timely and regular bowel habits to promote defecation, frequent elimination rounds, call bell within reach, answer promptly, provide well lit, clear path for easy accessibility to bathroom or commode. Assess patients' functional limitations and assist patients to the bathroom if necessary. Use of assistive device such as anal plug, incontinence sheets or diapers. Diet modifications include avoiding food or drinks that cause loose tool and frequent bowel movement. Increase fiber and bulking agents. Encourage patients to drink at least 6 to 8 glasses of fluid unless medically prohibited. Nursing management for fecal incontinence. Skin care. Regular skin monitoring per shift. Encourage good personal hygiene. Assist with perinal care and contaminants device as needed. Apply skin protector frequency if necessary. Example, skin barrier cream. Last but not least, pharmacological intervention. Constipating agents such as loperamide, laxative, animals, and suppository can be useful in those with co-existing evacuation disorder. Now let's move on to constipation management. In general, constipation is thought to be a consequence of poor fluid intake, use of constipation-inducing medications, poor dietary fiber, and decreased mobility and increased dependence rather than a direct effect of the stroke. Medical management of constipation includes pharmacological intervention such as laxatives if not contraindicated such as lactulose and senna. Suppositories can be used if not contraindicated but try to avoid fleet enemas in the elderly if possible. You should aim for patients to have one good bowel movement at a regular time each day. Let's move on and talk about the nursing management of constipation. Nursing management for constipation includes lifestyle modification, timely and regular bowel habits, prevent persistent suppression of the urge to open bowels, 
frequent elimination rounds, providing privacy and a clean environment, and allowing sufficient time to defecate. Encourage early mobilizations and active lifestyles. Dietary and fluid modifications. Encourage patients to eat a healthy, well-balanced diet, including fibers. Constipation is often related to dehydration in the colon. Therefore, we encourage patients to have adequate intake of fluid up to 1.5 to 2 liters per day unless medically contraindicated. This is an example of the bistro stool chart. The bistro stool chart helps patients and healthcare workers to evaluate stool consistencies and form. Being regular is a way of describing good bowel habits or normal bowel function. Patients are taught to monitor their bowel habits daily together with the bistol stool chart to make lifestyle adjustments accordingly. Other physical interventions that can be taught by the rehab nurse in the rehab unit include digital stimulation, manual evacuation, abdominal massage, and rectal irrigation. We've come to the end of our presentation. Our take-home message. Firstly, bladder and bowel complications are the most common medical complication to occur post-stroke. Secondly, they can lead to increased morbidity for patients and associated with poorer long-term outcomes. And thirdly, they can be prevented by simple non-pharmacological interventions and medications as highlighted above. These are our references. Thank, Thank you, you for, for your time, time and, and attention. attention.